Snakes and Adders. This is next in our intermediate series of reptile guide videos. Today we're discussing blood pythons or short tailed pythons. This is a Malaysian blood python. You can hear its displeasure. Uh, we'll get to that later. I mean, some blood pythons are even tempered, others not so much. So I'm going to try and stay very quiet and not uh, annoy it too much. I'll probably end up putting it back in the box because it's just going to get too wound up. Um, the thing to understand with these snakes is when you start handling them you light a fuse and that fuse is a predetermined length we don't know how much patience we're going to get out of the snake um, they will behave themselves to a point but then they, be, they become quite bolshy when they've had enough and they make their displeasure known um, the problem you've got is with them being so heavily built is if they start to flail or chuck their body weight around there isn't enough of them for your hands to keep up and quite often they can slip out of your hands they just pull their way through they've got very slender necks and incredibly powerful bodies so the risk is if you try and restrain a blood python by its head you can actually cause irreparable damage to its neck because it will throw coils around itself trying to pull its head free and it's so strong it can actually hurt itself so there's three types of blood pythons available there is the traditionally what was known as red, black and brown bloods. Yes, hello, I can see you. Come on. Let me bring you around here. Come on. Thank you. Red, black and brown bloods. Uh, they're a bit more complex than that now. Um, but when I first started, there was red, black and brown. Um, so the have uh, all been elevated to their own species status. This is a red blood python, this is python brongas my. The black blood python or Sumatra blood python is called python curtis and then the borneo blood python or borneo short tail python is uh, python brightsteini. The elevation to species specific status was based on their scalation on their heads. I will share a diagram of snake scales on the heads uh, and I'll include notes on what they decided were the differences so that you'll be able to see. Uh, I think it's to do with the parietal scales and preocular scales, uh, but again, I'll make sure that those details are included at the end. So, um, what we'll also do is discuss where um, they are from. Your red blood python bronze my its type locality is Malaysia, uh, or the Malay Peninsula. The brown blood python, which is Python bright Steini, type locality is Borneo or Kalimantan. And the uh, black or Sumatran blood, Curtis, Python Curtis, type locality is Sumatra. They vary slightly in eventual adult lengths. I mean, in captivity, they all kind of average five to six feet. Uh, but in their wild forms, they were always noted that the reds were the biggest, with females attaining six to seven feet in length. Uh, although quoted sizes are larger than that. Uh, for some of the wild caught specimens over the years. Brown bloods are five to six feet and the black bloods are four to five feet. Um, they are egg layers like all pythons, they have maternal instincts, they will wrap around their eggs. The eggs are incredibly large, the baby is heavily built and they will take a good sized meal from birth. Um, we incubate them at 32 degrees, they hatch after 65 to 70 days um, and they generally are unproblematic to start they're born with big yolk sacs, so you may find that there is a bit of a time delay from them being born to the point where they want to actually start to feed. But once they're off and running, there's no problem really, they feed fairly readily. Uh, temperament, best described as variable. Um, this guy, I'm keeping away from my face. He's got the heat pit, so he probably uh, can see me and he's keeping a beady eye. Uh, and no doubt that fuse is running incredibly low at this point. Um, they can either be puppy dog tame, certainly if, if you work with them regular, some are going to remain irascible, huffy, um, occasionally if stressed they'll also musk or spray, uh, which is uh, unpleasant to say the least. They kind of chuck their tail around in a, in a circle and uh, spray whatever's within the vicinity. This doesn't always happen. But, you know, we're dealing with an intermediate level snake now. We're not dealing with a beginner snake. You take something like a blood python on, you've got to work with it even during its off days, you know. Um, to describe their build, I mean, it's just insane how big they, they are uh, bodily. 
even at five or six feet, a girl will have the same sort of circumference around her midriff that a 15 foot Burmese would. They're so incredibly built. Um, and again, that just makes them slightly more difficult to handle. If they decide to throw the coils, they want to move, they've had enough, um, it can be difficult to keep up with them because there's just not enough body to do so. Um, as youngsters, sometimes they can become uh, they can become issues with respiratory infections. Um, a lot of the younger Southeast Asian pythons, whether that be white lips, um, the, the water pythons, the Bismarcks, bloods, see it's striking in the box now, um, they develop respiratory infections quite easily and they're heavily reliant on high humidity. So this is one of those occasions with the youngsters that I probably would recommend a racking system because we've arrested a certain amount of airflow, this helps to increase humidity. The overall raising humidity helps to keep their, uh, their lungs lubricated and we don't really get the respiratory illnesses. As the snakes grow, as with all of the pythons, the reliance on humidity lessens, the skin gets thicker, it's easier for them to shed, etc, etc, and they just don't seem as prone to it. So this is probably down to immuno response, uh, and as they grow, obviously, their immune system becomes stronger, and it uh, deals more quickly with issues or stresses that are present. Um, generally, basking temperatures are going to be between 30 and 32 degrees. Your blood python is not going to do a lot inside its tank. This is the classic form of sit and wait predator. It's going to do next to nothing. If you want to have a heavily built snake, an impressively built snake, but don't necessarily have the room for a Burmese or a retic, then a blood python potentially could be for you. They're not going to require huge tanks simply because they won't use it. It's the, it's the truth. You know, they're, they are, are incredibly sedentary. So it tends to be a bit more of an even temperature range. It's not so much hot end and cold end and expecting your snake to migrate through the tank because a blood python just won't. So, uh, yeah, 30 to 32 degrees uh, and then maybe a cool end of maybe 27, 28. So rather than having our heater hard up against one end, we may migrate it slightly more towards the centre so that the, the gradient is more shallow and that will help you out. Orchid bark as a substrate or um, and you can also use maybe a sphagnum moss hide box if they're going to shed their skin. Uh, but as I say, as they get bigger, it becomes less and less of an issue with the humidity. Just spray them once they, they drop into the milk and they're going to start shedding their skin. Um, I think blood pythons are fantastic. I've kept blood pythons over a lot of years. In my personal experience, the most even-tempered of the bloods that I've kept are the Borneo blood pythons. Um, the black bloods are more manageable because of their size. Um, there's a couple of naturally occurring forms with these silk. They've either got silver heads or they've got orange heads. I prefer the silver heads. They give them this exanthic look. They re look really cool. Uh, they're now being selectively bred in big numbers. They're producing some awesome, and I mean awesome, morphs. Whether that be magpie, cherry bombs, ultra brights, all sorts of stuff. They're just insane. Ivories, they're awesome as well. Um, and because they're a slightly more select crowd who keep bloods or a certain type of demented, they uh, have held their value. They're not reaching the hands of people who are too inexperienced. Generally, this value means that, it, that they're being kept by people who want to keep them, who've researched them, and obviously invest in a decent sum of money. They uh, are going to respect the animals that they keep. Uh, I think that blood pythons are a great next step snake. Uh, there certainly can be a challenge. If you get a tame one, they're, they're ace. They're just like a super-sized royal python. Um, they're incredibly good feeders. They feed like mad, um, but they don't poo like mad. And this can concern a lot of people. Sometimes you can go two, three months before they have a turnout, and then when they go, you'd think that Red Rum had snuck into the tank and decided to go for it, you know? Um, that's perfectly normal, just down to their sedentary nature. Uh, getting maximum nutrition out of food before passing the waste um, and yeah they're capable of large meals you know if you're thinking about most people match the girth of an animal to its prey these animals are going to be able to take a good sized meal and that's all down to their natural design with being a sit and wait predator it might be three four months between meals uh, whatever walks past I've got to be able to take because I can't afford to miss that opportunity uh, do your research python brongas my Python Brightest Steini, Python Curtis. Um, 
a brilliant snake brilliant snake not for everybody though uh, and definitely worth your research uh, and make sure that you find a good reliable place like ours who will give you honest advice and not just try to sell it you as your first snake uh, i hope the video has been of use visit the website which is www.snakesandadders.co.uk to see what we're all about cheers